Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. And welcome to Game Changers Live, everyone. So great to have you here. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We're now a top 2% podcast ranked globally by Listen Notes, and we're coming to you live from our studio home at Florida National University's College of Communications. If you love what you're listening to, make sure to like and subscribe to, to not miss an episode. So today, my guest is Rob McEwen, and Rob McEwen is the head of McEwen Mining, he is the chairman and chief owner of the mining company, which has three producing mines in Nevada, Ontario, and Argentina, and holds 68% in uh, interest in the large uh, Los Azules copper project in Argentina. Rob has been associated with the gold industry all his career, his first 18 years in the investment industry, and then since 1990 as CEO in several gold mining companies. He's the founder of Gold Corp, which you may have heard before if you're in the gold industry you've heard, definitely heard of gold corp where he took the company from a market cap of 50 million to over eight billion dollars so one of the things that I, I i love to get into in this show and we're gonna we'll talk a lot about kind of what makes you tick and how you got your success um tell me a bit about your background where where did you start off you know what was growing up like what were some pivotal inspirational moments in your life when you when you first started because I don't think uh, most people understand where they're heading at a very early age. It's something you got to feel through. I guess from seven to 17, I wanted to be an architect. And uh, I guess my last year of high school, I hadn't spent enough time uh, being diligent. And I ended up saying, well, what's next? So I looked at economics. Uh, and my father had introduced me to gold when I was my early teens. He had, uh, he was in the investment community. He had me charting stocks when I was 10 and 11 and wow. started investing when I was 12. Um, and he just saw that gold um, was going to play a role in the future as currencies were being debased. So it was almost by osmosis. There were conversations at the dining room table that uh, convinced me that I should be going towards gold, that there was more opportunity there was lots of opportunity for discovery. Um, so after college, I joined a brokerage firm, started doing research in that space, um, then sales, uh, went back to school, got an MBA, and then uh, joined Merrill Lynch, and then went out and bought control of my father's firm a couple of years later, and investing in junior mining companies, uh, oil and gas, doing research, and eventually one day I said, I want to see if I can get into the jet stream. I'd met a lot of people who discovered deposits and I thought it was time to do it myself. You know, what was going through your mind at that point when, when you start kind of going into areas that you're not familiar with? Was there hesitation? Was there kind of imposter syndrome in the sense that, okay, well, I don't know anything about this. Why would they like me president? And how did that serve you moving forward? I had never, when I was going through college, I didn't spend any time with many people in student politics. And the one day I went to lunch with uh, my biz prof, and he said, um, what are you gonna do next year? It was, I was my last year, and he said, why don't you run, you ever thought of student politics? <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> no. But after lunch, um, I was going to go meet some friends to go down uh, I was an instructor in the ski school, uh, and I was water meeting, skiing. Uh, or well, I did water skiing. skiing, and I used to compete there. But um, this was snow skiing. All right, all right. <laughs> <It was Canada. laughs> <laughs> so uh, I made arrangements to meet some of my fellow instructors at the pub that afternoon, and uh, I was meeting them at their. I was first going to their office and. I walked by the student council office, walked in, talked to the student president for about an hour. And then this, the chief financial officer. And then I walked down to the pub. And in the first half hour, someone walked in and said, I hear you're running for student council president. I thought, that's odd. And then 
An hour or so later, we were spending some time at the pub. Uh, someone else came in and said that. So over the weekend, it was a Friday, over the weekend I thought about it. I said, well, let's jump in. And my two roommates said, well, you need 20 nominations. And we were sitting in a large cafeteria. And they said, well, why don't we go around? We're going to talk to all the pretty looking girls and get their <laughs> phone numbers and names. And when at, we'll just point to you. So when we point over there, you stand up and wave. And That guy is running for president. Yeah, he's good looking enough. We'll vote for him. Right. <laughs> So uh, that got me in student politics. Um, eight people ran for president. I came in uh, second. And I thought, well, let me see. I just entered the day the nominations closed. If I'd spent a little more time at this, maybe I could have. So right. uh, a couple of years later, I went and did my MBA. And I was drawn like a, a moth to a flame. And they wanted a student council rep. And then... The president, the then president said, why don't you run next year for president? And so I became head of the Graduate Business Council and part of the Graduate Student Council and advisors to the deans. And I just realized at that point, you know, rather than stepping away from responsibility, you step in and embrace it and you have much better control of your future. You can drive it. Um, so that that's in the student politics side and always uh after that always wanted to lead see that and that and that's interesting you know really taking advantage and taking ownership of of situations that are presented to you because i think a lot of times we have opportunities that are presented to us that we just either don't embrace or don't see it or perhaps we're intimidated by it and we just kind of say yeah i'm not gonna I'm not gonna go in there because there's a risk of embarrassment you know of uh hey I, I don't know what i'm doing here but uh i can figure it out and so having that confidence in yourself to say okay whatever i'm going to go into i'm i'm going to have the resolve to kind of see see what i can do here right and do my best yes i i I'd say there was another experience that's very powerful and that was you mentioned water skiing i used to compete doing that but um i saw a kite go by one day so water ski kite flying. It's an obscure little area. Yeah, kite surfing. Uh, and I, I had taught water skiing at a resort one summer during high school. And I, the next year I saw someone go by on a kite. And I said, well, I should buy one of those, uh, which I did. And I went to my first competition and they said, there were a number of tricks. You did a slalom run and a gymnastics run. And they said, why don't you join us next year? And these were some of the best flyers in North America. They, um, at the competition the next year, they said, what, are you, what tricks are you going to do? And I said, well, I have a couple. And they said, that's not enough. And they led me over to a tree where they tied a frame of the kite up in the tree. And for two hours, they just showed me these gymnastics tricks. Above, this day above. of the competition? Yes. We, wow. we had a gap. Uh, and they said, now do the tricks you know, and then try some of these that we've just shown you. And I guess it was the confidence they were instilling me to try it. Mm -hmm. So I went out, did my three tricks, and I still had time on my trick run. So I said, well, I'll do one of them. It was a little shaky. It encouraged me to do the next one, and it worked. And so I said, all right, the last one, just my finale. I'm gonna do one that's gonna drop me out of the sky. I'm sure of it. And it was an inverted layout. You're hanging upside down and I, and it worked. And it surprised the heck out of me. And I just went, you know what? I've created the barriers in my mind that tell me I can't do it. And they're, the realization is they're artificial. They don't mm. exist. And um, ever since then, I've always quested for areas where I push into the unknown, where I would hesitate normally. What is it about? So, I mean, that's a that's an incredibly important point, and I I don't think enough of us take the chance and or have the confidence in ourselves to 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 take on those you know step into the unknown, so to speak. You were about to perform a trick that you just learned in a contest where you're hanging upside down, thirty feet above the water. You could have potentially killed yourself. Uh, just, what, you bang you know, yourself up. You wouldn't die. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like you would, right? When you hit that water, it's pretty hard. But 
you know, when, when you went for it, were you just not thinking about it? Were you in a bit of a state of flow? Were you just like, you know, trust and it's going to happen? I'd say a state of flow. I mean, you know, the first couple worked and the, that gave me the encouragement to go for it again. Just push it another step. So is that a lesson, obviously, that has you've carried with you and you've applied it in different areas of, of your life and, and in business? How do, you, how do you get yourself into the state of flow? Because there have been a lot of books written in you know, Stephen Kotler and other ones uh, that have tried to decode flow and you know, what it is and how do we get ourselves into, into that state almost intentionally, not only you know, in, in the sporting arena, but in your day-to-day -day when you have a presentation to give and you're you know, perhaps afraid of giving presentations. And how do you get into that state where we can be our best? Is that something that you've learned to harness over the years? I think it's looking at it and saying there's an opportunity, so give it a try. Um, or it looks like fun and let's do it um, because I haven't done it before. Um, <laughs> I, I was in Switzerland maybe 10 years ago and uh, in Samaritz and there was a bobsled mm -hmm. run and I went as a passenger in a bobsled and we inverted and I found it interesting. Um, wow. So after that, I was walking from the bobsled club and three blocks away in the town, I heard this British commentator over a loudspeaker and there was a luge, a skeleton run. And I walked up onto a viewing stand and the British forces were training for a competition the next day. And I got talking to a major and I watched people going down and you're, you're going down on a piece of metal that is about two feet wide and, uh, three feet long at the most and you lie on it and you go down this ice chute head first and you're going from one town to the next and you get up over you can get up over 70 miles an hour wow uh, traveling and when you're that close to the ice it probably feels like a hundred right Maybe you're just a few inches off the ice. Um, and i i watched some of the guys come along and i said well if they could do it i could do it and, <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> So the next morning I went over and uh, went down the course three times and you, uh, it was a rush. Wow. But w not ever having done it in your life. No. And you actually made it down the right way, not, not on your back or anything or on your head or your, <laughs> your Well, you can blow out of the course and uh, they, they recommended, they give you a little bit of training and they recommended you take a, a Swiss medical insurance out and they said, uh, we'll have a doctor by your side in five minutes. We'll have an ambulance in 10 and if required, a helicopter in 15. Wow. It's, it's called the Cresta Run for amusement. You should look it up on. Just Google it. Jeez. So I, I, I lived in, in Geneva in Switzerland for, for about three years. And so I, I, can, I can just imagine, you know, what that must have been like and that experience. How do you then, you know, do you, do you put yourself in these situations intentionally or do you just kind of like subconsciously end up in these opportunities where you know you just say oh yeah I'll, I'll try it usually they don't just let you try things like that right <laughs> <laughs> i mean can i just go there and go yeah i want to do it and you could do, it. do it yes though they'll, they'll, they'll show you um maybe do if they, if the health uh tip doesn't scare you off then they just show you a, a life-size picture a skeleton and they said, you know, our executive team over the years, um, they show all the injuries starting at breaking your toes and your ankles and your, your shins and your knees and your thigh wow. bones and then your hips and all the way up to your head uh, <laughs> of all the injuries. And at that point, they try to discourage you. So, um, oh my gosh. So what, what else do you want to do that you haven't done yet that perhaps scares you a bit? Um, my wife and I are booked on uh, Virgin Galactic to go up into space. Wow. Um, we're just waiting for that. Richard had to go, Richard Branson had to go first, and then they're just coming up with a schedule of timing. So we'd be in the first couple of hundred people to go into space. Really? So you've already booked your seat? Oh yes, paid, paid for and ready to go. 
Wow. And so, so tell me about that. You know, so you got to meet him, you know, you, you, you book your, uh, I guess you put a deposit down and uh, then is there some training, I guess, the intro, you know, what does um, that flight plan look like? There's um, a zero gravity flight where you go in a 737, it's um, they take out the front two thirds seating and they line the whole plane, the floor, the walls, the ceiling with gym mats. And you go up and there's 15 sessions of 30 seconds where you're weightless and they're interspersed with uh, a minute or so of twice gravity. So it's like someone's sitting on you. Yes, yeah, so you can get a feel. A minute for or two and then 30 seconds where you're just floating. Um, I took uh, my youngest, my eldest son at the time, he was nine and went up and we uh, floated around in the cabin. You're chasing water that's little spheres. They train the astronauts in that. And then there's a, a centrifuge you have to go on to uh, acclimatize to the number of Gs you're going to be subjected to when the rocket breaks loose from the, uh, the plane that's lifting it up. So I haven't done that yet, but I'm looking forward to it because you're going to get to experience, um, I think, the acceleration is at about six Gs. So you want to oh be familiar gosh. with that six people standing on you effectively wow. <laughs> while you break away. That's incredible. It's short lived. It's short lived. But so those yeah. those are really the two things. Um, and so how how high will you guys be? How many miles? You'll be up to the edge of space. You'll be where the blue and the black touch. Right. And just for how long? That, you... It's about a seven minute up there. Seven you're, you're in the air for about two hours. Wow. That's unbelievable. And you get you're... to look beyond our world and see the world below and it's beauty. Yeah, that, that's got to be one of that's going to be one of the most amazing, you know, things that any human can experience in, in their lifetime. Yes. Unbelievable. Wow. That's going to be cool. Right. So I'll, I'll be tracking that with you. I'll be, <laughs> hopefully you do a little uh, YouTube live or Instagram live or, or record that, of course, and, and capture that moment. Um, so have, have you met Richard Branson? I'm assuming you have. Yes. So what, how, what is he like? Very engaging. Um, he loves challenges. Um, yeah, you can see that. <laughs> a, a big sportsman. He spent, wow. um, yeah, a couple of vacations down at Necker Island, um, yeah. where he has his home. Right, right. So let me get back to you then. You know, when you look at everything that you you're, you're doing in your life, obviously you you seem to be taking advantage of every opportunity. Get you know breaking past those barriers that we've put up for ourselves, and that happens to everyone. Right. Uh, how do you define success? Because it seems that, you know, there's folks that define success by reaching a goal and there's others that define success by getting 1% better every day and they fall in love with the process uh, and, and, you know, the breakthroughs that they have not only externally, but internally. I think there's something that you said um, that we'll get into with the gold stuff, but you had mentioned in a previous interview that you know, the, the, the biggest gold mine deposit in your, in the world is not in the ground. It's in between the ears. And so, you know, what does success look like for you? It's a very good question. I don't know if I've ever really defined it. Um, that where you said my quote about the biggest gold mine in the world between the ears, that came out of a, a contest, that perception. We took all of our, we were, I bought control of a couple of mining companies and one of them was um, considered at the end of its life. It was high cost, had a history of difficult labor relations, um, and they figured it was going to close in a couple of years. I thought it had opportunity. It was right next door to a, a rich gold mine and I felt they hadn't explored it enough. So put $10 million in, we went exploring. and. A few months later, my geologist came back and said, we have, we've encountered gold a mile below surface. That's 30 times what the concentration we're mining. And then about a year later, our engineers came along and said, well, we found this much more gold. Um, we should build a mine of this size. And I said, why do you want to build a mine of that size? It's, we keep 
fine. We've been adding to our resources by 30% a year. Uh, shouldn't we be thinking something bigger? Um, and they said, well, that's all the information we have. And I said, well, but we've been finding more. So I asked our uh, head of exploration, how much gold is here? And he said, I don't know. And I said, that's the wrong answer. And it's how long it's going to take. And he said, I don't know. And another wrong answer. And so with that, that encouraged me to, uh, after a course at MIT, to uh, end up at saying, we're going to throw all of our geological data up on the web and ask the world to tell us where we could find the next 6 million ounces of gold in our mine um, and offered half a million dollars in prize money. So it was wow. one of the very early examples of incentivized crowdsourcing. Um, and that was in year 2000. And the mining industry looked at it and said, this is and crazy. So essentially, you, you opened up your books and said, hey, guys, here's here are our plans. Here's where we're, we're going to dig. Where else are we going to find it? Yes. And 1,500 people from 50 countries took down a 400 megabyte file of proprietary data that the industry never gave away. So we took an old industry wow. that was considered very backwards and we used today's tools uh, to look for gold. And we found about $3 billion worth of gold. So, um, and we spent half a million dollars in prize money and half a million dollars to set it up. So, um, geez, oh my but, gosh, what a return. I thought that was successful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's incredible. I mean, that, that takes guts when you were going through the, the process of saying, okay, let's put out all our, all our information out on the web. What were people telling you? Why are you doing that? It sounds like a child's game. Um, and I said, well, I said, are you crazy? What, you know, yeah, are you crazy? I mean, no one does this. Maybe someone will take you over. And I said, well, if they take us over, they're going to be paying premium. Um, and the uh, people I worked with, my geologist said, well, someone's going to, it sounds like you think all of us are stupid <laughs> because you're asking the world to tell you where the gold is. And I said, no, if they come along and say, have the same targets that you had, it's going to be a lot easier for me to just say, here, I'll write a check and here's your program. Um, yeah, but, give them a finder's fee and you got a lot more minds and eyeballs kind of working on things than just the ones in in your in your uh, in your business yeah there were far i remember we launched it at a major mining conference and had television crews and had all sorts of terminals where people could enter and i bumped into a bunch of analysts in the afternoon um and they said well what's this game all about i don't understand it um, <laughs> and there, there was one in about 10 he said you know this is going to work but, you know, it was just that small number of people that were saying, uh, this has a possibility of being big. And it turned out to be quite large. Um, we took a company, my company wasn't, didn't have a huge profile. We had a nice discovery, but it vaulted us into the stratosphere. And we, it went far beyond um, just the mining industry. Business Week named us as one of the 50 most innovative companies on the web in 2000. Wow. Books written on it. It was a lot of fun. And what, what, how did you come up with that idea? Uh, I came into the mining industry, looked at it, and had a lot of questions about why are we doing it this way? Why are you doing it this way? And so I enrolled in a course. And it was more of just a, a learning yes. question, more than you're actually questioning them. You're just, just understanding, it, you know, coming from a different <laughs> point of view. Well, it's sort of Sergio. I mean, if <laughs> is, tell me why we're doing it this way and have kept doing it for so long. And why, what are the alternatives? And mo more often they didn't consider alternatives. They've been so, it's all about the formulation of a question. Mm. What, I mean, you, you look at it and say, well, what is, what are the fundamental assumptions underlying a particular business or organization? 
and can you take a look at those fundamental assumptions and question them? So a lot of people, most of the people in the mining industry here, they took geology, they took mine engineering. I took neither of those. I came from the investment industry. So my perspective was different and it might have varied by a couple of degrees, but I was able to see, I was able to question what wasn't part of my fundamental training. And that's where the, it, the doors of opportunity open up. Wow. And so l- let me ask you, was there a, a time in your life where you, where you failed in a big way and that caused some, perhaps some doubt, some questioning as to, or, you know, has, has it all been kind of a string of, of, of wins and not too many failures that you learned from? missed opportunities um certainly looking at the market and making certain assumptions as i said earlier on uh, my first investment when i was 12 and um in a short space of time i made nine times on my money and i thought wow that's pretty good wow what, what did you invest in an insurance company okay and, it, it said, split. oh, this is easy, right? <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> played this game all day. <laughs> exactly. Well, it probably took me about 30 years to repeat that. Wow. Um, it just, uh, there were moments when the market went the other way, like it always does. Yeah. yeah. And you learn some humility or a lot. <laughs> um, and I, I say some of the others was just not going forward with some of my thoughts. Um, as to what I want to do, looking at a, um, a takeover of a company six times our size, and I'd bought 5% of it, made it nervous, and the investment banker said, at least the juniors on the team said, oh, we could do this. And then the head of the firm came along and said, no, we're not going to support this. Um, then and later... I learned that he was a good friend of the CEO of the company that I wanted to take over. Ah, wow. So there was, um, you just have to look for these moments and ponder who you're dealing with. We probably would have won, I think. We were, we were running really fast. We traded at three times our net asset value. We were a, a star in the market and the company I wanted to take over was a laggard. Um, but so it's more, I don't like to use the term regret, but it was a missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you hesitate going through the door, which I should know. But I mean, life was good already, but it could have been more interesting. But it also came when there are certain times in your life when unexpected events happen. So in that, in that period, one of my sisters died and then three months later my mother died and you go into a space where you you doubt if you have the time or can muster the strength at that moment to execute a trade like that Mm -hmm. and those are those are the unknowns and the unexpected that bump you off your your course sometimes so yeah for, for me, my biggest fear in life is is not to regret something I have done, but to regret something I haven't done. And so yes. I, I don't want to be looking back on my deathbed and say, man, I wish I would have done that when I was 40 or 30 or 50 or whatever, you know, whatever age it is. I would rather fail and fall on my face, but at least know, all right, well, I tried it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did something because I think that's what gives life excitement. Oh, exactly. I have this quote that um, I have beside my desk and it's um i it's from a uh, rabbi lawrence cheval uh, i think he's in florida but life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of ri- arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body but rather skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke thoroughly used up totally worn out and loudly proclaiming wow what a ride exactly that's fantastic that, that I, i've heard that and that always resonates with me so well because it's true i mean time goes by so quickly 
in a blink and before you know it, you know, the, the days are long, but the years are short. And all of a sudden you find yourself at, at a point in your life where you're like, wow, how did I get here? Um, but it's like the little things that you do every day that count. So what what does a, a day, a typical day for you look like? What's working out? What's healthy eating? How much does that have, a, you know, the people in your life, kind of the things you focus on? Take mm. us through that. Well, I wake up in the morning. I like to do some exercise. Um, I've played a lot of sports through life, and so I just want to be fit enough to keep doing that. Sure. Um, then I have to take a look at the gold price, um, see if it's going up or down. And we have a couple of projects right now that are taking a lot of attention. Um, I think they're, uh, they could propel us. Um, for... The last couple of years, we had operational issues at our gold and silver mines. And the guidance we gave the market, we didn't meet. And so there was um, an amazing, no, <laughs> horrific, I'll say, loss of goodwill. Oh, and yeah. our stock price went south in a hurry. Um, it's turning around now. But uh, during that period, it was very difficult to see... Uh, <laughs> the sunshine yeah can imagine and you just had to keep keep your head down and keep pushing um because a lot of people thought you should just leave the game um, wow and it's and that it just it weighs heavily on it and um, i take a dollar a year but that doesn't really compensate for the uh the erosion and price that happened and the disappointment that I'd have to say all of our shareholders felt because mm -hmm. been, we'd had such a great run in Gold Corp and, and, and even in the earlier years, our share price was you know, volatile, like cyclical in the, the industry. But um, to see it heading south for so long was uh, difficult to deal with. Yeah. But just keep push, pushing. So tell me more about McEwen Mining. Um, what made you decide to to start your own uh, corporation and what do you think the future is of gold with all the debasing of the currencies through inflation obviously oh. you think it has a tremendous outlook so tell me about kind of how you started there and why and what you think the future is for the company and the gold industry a bit of a story um i decided at, at gold corp we were one of the lowest cost producers of gold in the world um, and I, at one point I got pretty tired of seeing a board that was getting more conservative and more focused on compliance mm. and checklists. Um, Which there are and many. I thought we were getting, the board was getting distracted by the over-regulation of the industry. I mean, we, we, we were nominated, we had, and we had great financials. Um, anyhow, I just felt like a, at one point a bull in a field and there are all these red flags and I was charging at the the illogical application of many of the regulations we face today. Mm. There's just massive amounts of paper and I just didn't understand how any shareholder had a chance of understanding what's being put out by right. public companies. It's just too much information. Anyhow, I felt like this bull charging at the illogical application. The intent, I always agreed with, but the application was horrible. So I said, I'm leaving. Um, I was, I think, the largest shareholder. Um, we had 400 million in cash. We had no debt, and we were the lowest cost gold producer in the world. Wow. And I said, this is a good time to leave. The company's in great shape. I bought another company before I left, put it into Gold Corp, and we tripled in value pretty quickly. Um, so then I stepped out and I said, well, I'm really not sure what I want to do next. Um, but I'd always invested in junior mining companies, exploration stories. So I said, well, I'll start doing that. Uh, or I'll just continue it. Because I did that when I was in Gold Corp and it re the profits we made reduced our capital requirements for building our mines by a considerable amount. 
So I went out and started buying 10 to 30% interests in exploration companies and developed a fairly large portfolio. And I thought, well, why don't we put a couple of them together? And that created a, I bought into a company called US Gold. We, um, I think I bought in it, I bought a third at 36 cents and about seven months later, it was up at $9. Wow. Uh, my goodness. And then about a year and a half later, it was down to 50 cents. <laughs> a couple of years later, it was back up to $9. Wow. What a, what a ride. Uh, yeah. That's a yeah. hair-raising ride. That's like being hung up upside down 30 feet above the water and then, uh, you know, <laughs> crashing and then going back up and, yeah. oh my goodness. So, uh, and then I decided to put two of them together and that created McEwen Mining. The timing wasn't the best because it was the beginning of 2012 when the commodity cycle had broken. And uh, so we had a lot of, we had these high values on our book, a lot of goodwill. Um, added some more properties along the way. So I ended up with mines in Mexico, um, in Nevada and uh, properties in Argentina, joint venture down there and a, a large copper project that I thought had very big potential. Um, however, the copper price dropped to about 60 cents. Um, today it's at $4. Uh, and just started saying, well, can we get to the point where we were with Gold Corp, where we paid a dividend every month and we enjoyed a very low cost of capital. Those are two things I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'll take a large interest in the company. My investment between McEwen Mining and McEwen Copper, which we own 62% of, is over $220 million as my cost base. Uh, and I thought, well, I would like to have a large investment so that whatever happens to the stock price, um, I'll experience the pain or more of it than what our shareholders, my shareholders will. Right. I view them as partners as more like an investment banker. Um, and so that's, it's really acquiring assets, seeing if you can improve the operations to a point where you're generating sufficient income. Right now we haven't generated income. We've generated losses, which aren't that attractive, but <laughs> we have this we have this copper we'll help you offset all the profits you're going to make later though right so right. <laughs> there you go that's the attitude <laughs> um and so we have a large copper project which i say it's i think it's going to turbocharge the value of McEwen mining we uh, it's the ninth largest undeveloped copper project in the world um it has at least at a preliminary economic assessment it has very robust economics, uh, long life, better than 36 years. It's in um, part of the world that produces 40% of the world's copper annually um, through, it's down the spine of South America. Right. Uh, so it, it's an exciting project and it's also an opportunity to see about creating a model for a new mine, a mine which I call a mine of the future that um, reduces its impact on the environment that um, has a lot less carbon, uses a lot less water, mm -hmm. uh, and is an attractive place to work. I mean, you can't get away from the fact we're going to dig a big hole in the ground and for a long time. Um, but can you do it without adding to the issues of our atmosphere? Um, right. And, and so that's quite exciting. Um, as I said earlier on, I, uh, early in life, I wanted to be an architect, and that's very project-oriented. Um, my wife and I uh, have a school of architecture named after us, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those areas where I think we can take and change, um, at least help change the perception of mining, which is very important to our modern day civilization. I mean, if we didn't have the metals, we wouldn't be able to enjoy what we enjoy today. Absolutely. We just, we just have to look at how do we do it in, um, in a manner that is uh, let's call it more responsible.
Interesting. Right. Well, Rob, let me tell you, 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 you've done some amazing, uh, things in your life, not only on the personal basis, but also in the business arena. And, and you shared a, a ton of no pun intended gold nuggets with us here today. So I appreciate that. And, um, you can find him and his company, mcewinmining.com and also on the New York stock exchange under M U X trading at $5 and 91 cents right now. And uh, yeah, you're doing some some amazing things, Rob. I, I appreciate your time here and, and sharing with the audience all, all the great uh, experiences and lessons that you've learned throughout your life. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable. So I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it. You may end up being the game changer in their lives.